So today's guest on Keenan Yoga is uh, Daniel Simpson. Daniel Simpson uh, has been a friend and uh, an incredible inspiration on the on the yoga scene for a number of years now. Um, and he's recently written a book which I'm really enjoying currently. Um, and unfortunately, I've also just literally forgotten the title of so daniel it's not a pl- it's not a plug for your book but <laughs> hold it up and show yoga. us the title okay right there we go the truth of yoga that was actually genuine i had actually literally forgotten that i kept thinking of another book of yoga what's it like? is this yoga by annie fox ah, this is another yeah. kind of yeah another another great book but but daniel's in fact is really really there's a real place in the market for this because it's really simple it really gives a good overview and it, it gives it in such terms that anyone even a dullard like me can understand so really get get behind it get a copy of it i really fully put my weight behind this and today we're going to just basically talk about some of the stuff i.e yoga and uh, what we'll call the sanatana dharma let's say or hinduism or indian thinking that uh, daniel tries to make some sense of because it's all this big i mean my my leading question daniel is like just to try and make a start of head or tail out of this like when we're talking of indian thought or south asian studies or the hinduism is almost pejoratively known now um, and that will be another question why don't we call it hinduism uh and what is this this what is this thing we're talking about that's maybe more politically correct now called the sanatana dharma what holds it together as a you know what holds a number of texts together as a thing you know what have they got is there anything we can say they've all got this in common right they all they talk about this and this is their fundamental approach yeah. Well, I think that word you use, Dharma, is the glue. Um, you know, you find that also more broadly. The Buddha talked about his teachings as the Dharma. Um, it's a general concept for a body of knowledge that explains, mm. you know, how to live in harmony with the way things are. And, uh, you know, I think mm. all, all aspects of Hinduism in their different ways are trying to, to make sense of, you know, our relationship to reality. <laughs> and uh, noting, um, you know, quite often from... Uh, about two and a half thousand years ago onwards, um, the problems we have with our relationship with reality. Before that, some of the older texts were much more just sort of, um, I guess, uh, mystical in some ways, but also you know, more functional. We were talking about a ritual, asking the gods to intervene mm. on our behalf. And uh, after that sort of fades into the background and philosophy comes into the picture, the question is, you know, what do we do? <laughs> How do we you know, have this sort of mediation process through the mind and the body? Um, and the mm. big question that arises you know, is why do we suffer? Why, why do we experience, you know, basically heartache? <laughs> and what can we do about mm. it? Um, mm. And of course, those but questions I mean, are asked in lots of other contexts. But in an exactly. Indian context... Yeah, why, wh- why doesn't it make it... Why can't we call a, a Christian text a part of the Sanatana Dharma? <laughs> or, or, or indeed, why can't we call Buddhism a part of it? Why, is it, why does it fall well, under the heading of a, a non-Orthodox text? <laughs> well, maybe we'll come back to that in a bit. Well, but, well, you know, here, we, here we well, get into the complexity yeah, yeah, this okay. phrase, Sanatana yeah. Dharma. Sanatana just means eternal. Um, and uh, the Buddha, in fact, in the Dhammapada, he uses the same phrase, uh, talking about the eternal teachings, effectively. Um, so it's not even in itself a phrase exclusively associated with Hinduism. It has only really been used as a sort of broad umbrella term um, in the last hundred years or so. Um, but is found in many old texts. It's found in the Mahabharata, uh, where it's um, yeah, a description really of um, the highest ideals of virtue. Um, so to, to, to sort of live in, in, in harmony with all beings, to prioritize love for all beings, to prioritize not harming. Those are the sort of qualities that are described as the Sanatana Dharma. They, they, they apply to everybody in all circumstances, not specific to your caste or your stage of life, basically, which are the mm, ideas mm, that mm. tend to creep into the question of Dharma. Mm. Where was, I mean, where is this first? I mean, what, what's the position of the, the Vedas in, in this then? I mean, uh, how do they set the scene, as it were? And are they, re- and, you know, and the second question, are they readable? Because no one really seems to read the Vedas, right? I mean, uh, you know, I know this. I, uh, kind of the basic span of my, my information on this. Therefore, Veda, the Rig Veda is the oldest um, and kind of talk about ritual in a very kind of opaque way. I mean, is that, is that reasonable or can we kind of read them? You know, and get I and get mean, stuff out of them. Stories but... in the way that the, you know, the Mahabharata is a, an epic story. It's very long, um, uh, and you know, some of it's a bit obscure. But there's a narrative, and there's characters, and there are themes. Um, the Vedas, you know, the, the original context is as you described. I mean, they're, they're the soundtrack, effectively, to early Indian religion. They're literally the words that are recited by priests 
So the Rig Veda is largely, you know, hymns in praise of deities um, and by, you know, sort of bigging them up and saying how wonderful they are, um, blowing smoke up their backsides in the hope that they'll give us benefits in return. Mm. So it's, you know, please make mm. the weather you know, auspicious so that we can have good harvest so that we all thrive. Uh, please give us favor and fortune in battle. Uh, please give us offspring. That sort of thing is being requested. So it's a relationship with the forces of the, you know, the great unknowable, <laughs> that which we can't control. Um, in an attempt to bring it under some control. And so I suppose what happens in the later part of the textual collections that are broadly known as the Vedas, um, the last part of those being the Upanishads, there starts to be more of a philosophical inquiry into you know, how can we have some sort of influence over natural forces within ourselves. And the practice of yoga is one attempt to you know, engage with the world on that level. That is the microcosm of the mind and the body and its relationship with the macrocosm of you know, everything. <laughs> how, how can we bring that into some sort of balance? So, so the, you know, mm. the Vedic texts include the Upanishads, but then they span a you know, thousand years of history plus. <laughs> so um, mm. it's a very broad mm. label. Veda just means knowledge in Sanskrit. So it's, you know, the but there were knowledge. four, when they when they're four though, and, there are four uh, written strands. Certain, yeah, yeah. Um, so the written Rig Veda, at a certain time. Well, it's uh, hard, um, hard to say with written because <laughs> they were they, they were spoken, right. Well, they were recited. So priests right. learned the mantras um, by rote, um, and they are very precisely encoded in terms of how you pronounce them, so that it's possible to to, to you know, learn by heart. And they were handed down orally for you know, many many generations before they were actually set in writing in fact it was said you shouldn't put the vedas into writing only certain people were allowed to speak them the only certain people were allowed to hear them um and so they were handed down that way um perhaps it's only a thousand years ago that the first uh, manuscript collection of this this knowledge was compiled but um, it was preserved very faithfully due to the precision of the way it was recited so there's the rig veda um the uh, Yajur Veda, the Sama Veda, and the Atarva Veda, the four sort of strands of mm. this, this knowledge. But each of those are also subdivided into, into strata. So the earliest layer of this is what's called the Samhitas, the collections of the mantras. Um, and then there are sections called the Brahmanas, uh, relating to the Brahmins, the priests, basically an analysis of what the ritual is, why we do it, what it all means. Um, and then out of that grow Aranyakas and Upanishads, which are basically starting to become more philosophical. Firstly, mm. analyzing the ritual, you know, more in abstract, trying to make sense of it. And then ultimately just, you know, leaving the ritual behind, saying the ritual actually doesn't have the answer to the biggest question of life, which is why do we suffer? <laughs> the ritual is all concerned with, you know, we do something and we expect a result. Um, we ask the gods for favors, we want rewards. Um, yeah. Whereas yoga is the opposite. Practice. Yeah. 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 Yoga, yoga is analyzing the problem of wanting. Yoga is analyzing the problem of doing and instead trying to unwind the problematic consequences that come from impure investment in you know, action, basically. The problem of karma. So before we get onto yoga, I'm going to just clarify just to get mm. into my dumb head here about what where where is the position of the Upanishads then the Vedas because I thought that the Vedas the the four Veda were were authored or or heard revealed mm. at an earlier date and then the Upanishads were a kind of critique or a kind of a spiritual or philosophical kind of uh qualification of the original themes of these veda that came you know over then over centuries you know as the multitude of Upanishads were were authored uh, over the, you know, latterly, kind of like, you know, quite a while well, they, later. They, they all fall under the class of uh, what's called Shruti, that which is heard, as you say. So they're revelation. Mm, mm. So the, 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 the Samhitas, the hymns, uh, the Brahmanas, the Aranyakas and the Upanishads, all categories of Vedic knowledge fall under that, you know, broad spectrum of <laughs> this has not been authored by humans, it's been revealed by some divine source. However, you know, the texts themselves describe who composed the poems. There were rishis, the, the seers who channeled this knowledge um, so it's a bit of a you know <laughs> hybrid of the two things, and over time, what does happen is, as you say, you know, there's a speculation and inquiry, um, an analysis of, of what it means to be alive, and the Upanishads are engaged in that in a way that is completely different <laughs> to the early Vedic ritual. In a way, they're almost, as you say, critiquing it, saying it doesn't have the solution to the problems besetting humans. Um, but over time, 
the incredible inventiveness of the priestly tradition in India is to be able to fold any sort of challenge back into itself. So the Upanishads are still very much part of the Vedic collections, even though they're questioning whether the Vedic ritual works. You know, broadly speaking, Vedanta philosophy splits them into two camps. There's the Karma Kanda, is what it's called, the, the Vedic ritual passages. Um, and then there's the, 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 the part of the, the Vedic knowledge that's all about you know, insight, the Jnana Kanda, um, which is basically mm. Upanishads. Um, but they're still seen as like, a part of the same totality. And Hinduism has this wonderful right. ability to say, whenever we see distinction, whenever things look different, <laughs> basically they're just different manifestations of the same you know, ultimate oneness expressing itself in multiple forms. <laughs> so they can always collapse it back into itself. <laughs> I mean, are these different Veda, how do, the, the, you mentioned four strands, do they set forth some different kind of line, lineages or schools at that point or...? Well, they have um, yeah, family think... lineages because you know, not everybody could learn the entirety of the Vedas to recite it. And maybe somebody has, I don't know, but uh, it would be an enormous task. So instead, um, <laughs> some families specialised in some aspects of Vedic knowledge and passed down that you know, portion. So the Rig Veda um, has its particular sort of uh, lineages associated with it, similar to the other Vedic collections. And different Upanishads are sort of bolted on to each of those lineages. So some occur in the collection of the Rig Veda, oh others God. in you know, the Adya Veda. So a lot of, a lot of what <laughs> we know... Why did we ever lot, start this? Well, <laughs> a, lot, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of what we know about yoga comes uh, from one particular strand. Um, yeah, okay, it's it, getting easier, right? A lot yep. of it's coming out of the, the uh, particularly from the Krishnamacharya lineages is coming out of the Ajurveda. Um, okay. and so this is what we're looking it, for. Right. That's where you're getting into the Upanishads that start talking about right. yoga. It's also talking about you know some of some of some of the mantras that are associated with yoga practice today. So there is a sort of continuity of knowledge there that's that's being you know, kind of I guess expanded mm. and added to over time. But um, there is there there is there is a sort of you know. A, a vague trail that goes back to the Vedas, but most of what we think of as yoga has developed more recently than that. The Vedas are really just yeah. talking a different yeah. language. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll definitely we'll definitely try and get to that latterly. Um, <laughs> but before we before we kind of extricate ourselves from the tangle of the Veda, I mean, um, what what Upanishads would you kind of recommend uh, for people? I mean, because they they always say, oh, there's 108 Upanishads because it's a sacred number, and you know, I think there's probably more than that, really. I mean, but there's a hell of a lot of them, and there's, there's but there's a number of principal ones, I believe. Um, yes. You know, kind of like the most important and there's also and um, you mentioned your book in fact a couple of specific i, I didn't realize this the uh, upanishads that you kind of recommended as talking specifically about yoga and, and people don't really it probably you know really it's a shame they don't you know spend enough time on upanishads i think generally get the bag of a gita and the sutras rammed down your throat you know, on, the, on your yoga tt but you, you don't get so much stuff on upanishads so a very a proselytizer of, of going back to the upanishads and, and what would you recommend if people wanted to you know to have a little little wonder through the Upanishadic garden, as it were. Well, the very first place that yoga is actually defined in some recognisable way, um, i.e. doing something to sort of bring this kind of mind-body system under some degree of control, is in the Kata Upanishad. Mm. Um, and that says yoga is the restraint of the mind and the senses. So it's an internalisation of awareness, um, which leads to a higher knowledge. Um, and that's very clearly explained, and it's explained in quite an entertaining way. It's a dialogue between you know, the embodiment of death <laughs> and a young boy who goes to death and asks, you know, what's the meaning of life? Your death, mm. you should know. Um, and out of this, you know, it's, it's, it's still quite you know, opaque and esoteric, but there is an explanation, an analysis of the problem that you know, we get drawn out into the world through our sensory engagement with it. We try to gratify ourselves. Um, and this quest for satisfaction in the outside world leads to the problem of suffering because you know we can never get everything we want we get all sorts of things we didn't ask for um, and we're constantly you know led on this merry dance by senses you know, lusting after after you know satisfaction uh, by you know trying to get hold of things that we think will give us pleasure um, and the Kata Upanishad is saying well that's fine but you'll just be you know, constantly led astray if you're at the mercy of these things which will mean an endless cycle of birth <laughs> and the way out of that is to just you know, stop engaging with the outside world and instead engage with the inner world um, and purify perception to the point that you understand who you really are and that actually cures the fear of death because there isn't <laughs> there isn't really ultimately anybody there it's just an idea um, and 
once you see through this illusion, there's nothing left to be afraid of. So the Kata Upanishad is basically the foundation of you know, what is then turned into yoga philosophy. A lot of what Patanjali mm. teaches in the Yoga Sutras um, is basically an echo of the Kata Upanishad combined with a few other sources as well. Right, I'll we'll come to that in a second. The other, the other Upanishad, you mentioned another one as well. The Shveta Shvatara is also yeah. often mm. talked about, um, partly because it actually has a description of you know, it's the only postural instructions <laughs> you'll find in early texts. Sit up right. straight, keep the three parts <laughs> of the body upright, basically. You know, the torso, the, the neck and That's the head. Start. Yeah, yeah. Sit up straight. Certainly going to enable you to stay still um, and steady everything. And that's the process, really, of steadying the mind, steadying the senses. Um, and the Bhagavad Gita's description in the sixth chapter of meditation is, is basically you know, almost identical to what you find in the Shveta Shvata Upanishad. So scholars are a bit divided as to which came you, first. Um, but you essentially maybe they're saying ripped the same off. thing. Yeah. <laughs> we don't, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's yeah. so much copying and pasting goes on in, in yoga texts. Um, <laughs> It's an endless, endless remix. It's like remixes of remixes throughout history. Um, very hard to find the original song. <laughs> that's, that's kind of lost. No one, no one had a copyright at the time. Shame. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Only Patanjali had, had a copyright. You would be the millionaire, wouldn't he? Or billionaire now. Um, <laughs> well, it was, it was, um, well, what about the, I mean, going back, sorry, I'm going to go back to the Vader again. Where do we find this stuff? I mean, you know, another question before we get onto the big one of you know, yoga and where it came from and more about that. Now, where do we find the, uh, the the tripartite of Brahma, Shiva and Vishnu? We don't, I don't think we originally find it so much in the, in the, in the early Veda, do we? That it comes in later. Uh, and and exactly. how, how does that transpire? Well, it's really with the emergence of devotional religion. And again, you see a, a very clear similarity between what's in the Bhagavad Gita and the Shweta Shvata Upanishad, in which the deity is Shiva rather than Krishna, yeah, an avatar of Vishnu. Um, and uh, they're both basically explaining a very similar story that you know, God is present in the world. Um, actually, the world is made of God. It's a sort of energetic emanation from a single source out into everything else. And you can follow it back through everything in the world, through you know, things we observe in nature, through the body, ultimately, which is where you know, yoga practice eventually draws on it all um, back into an understanding of our place in the bigger picture. Um, so that is about 2000 years ago, this uh, you know, devotional religion starts to crop up in text. There's a lot of it in the Mahabharata as well, more broadly. Um, and devotion to Vishnu, devotion to Shiva are the two main strands of that. And then in the tantric traditions that come after that, particular focus on you know, various manifestations of the goddess also. Um, but before that, going back to the early Vedas, uh, the deities are completely different. I mean, there are mm, a couple of mm. mentions of Vishnu um, and a form associated with Shiva, Rudra is his name, the sort of fierce manifestation mm. of yeah. what later yeah. becomes the more benign. I mean, Shiva literally just means uh, auspicious, benevolent, yeah, kindly, <laughs> He'll, he who will help. Um, but Rudra means sort of you know, ferocious or howling. So he's a god of storms. And a lot of the Vedic deities are associated with either natural forces or power in some way. Um, and mm. the yeah, most supreme of them all is Indra. Um, there's Indra, mm. there's the god of fire, Agni, who is the mouth of all the other gods. There's uh, various uh, names for the solar deity. Um, there's Varuna, who's sort of, yeah, kind of, I guess, uh, instrument of justice, <laughs> who's sort of, yeah, I guess, in charge, therefore, of the idea of Dharma, although Dharma isn't really talked about quite so much in the early hymns. So there's all of these, yeah, literally kind of other deities, really, you know, not talked right. about so much in modern context. Um, and again, you know, people in India today talk about, you know, everything comes from the Vedas. <laughs> but first of all, most of what we think of today as Hinduism or yoga isn't found there. Um, and a lot of what is there is no longer observed or practiced. So it's not to say there's no connection at all. Um, there are the seeds of most things to be found in those texts, but they undergo a lot of transformation <laughs> between three and a half thousand years ago and today. Yeah. Um, oh, there's many places I could go from here. Um, what, what about the, just a quick one on, um, you know, <laughs> The idea of Hinduism. I mean, where do we get this term? Um, where did I mean, where and maybe a very cursory. I mean, if we kind of doing a yoga one hundred and one here, a very cursory idea of you know who were the people and the, the air, maybe the Aryan debate. If you speak a little bit about that, you know, just to round <laughs> off this little bit, <laughs> well, making you work all, hard yeah. here. Tread, yeah. tread, tread on like, all manner of landmines. Yeah, um, it's a catch-all, <laughs> little little roundup. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, hin Hinduism uh, as a sort of yeah category didn't really exist until British colonialists you know, tried to sort of quantify and um, identify the different religious groupings in India. Um, and they reached mm. for this name. Um, 
because you know, it, it would have been associated with people who lived in that part of the world. And the name given to, to the country at that time was Hindustan. And so the, the Hindus were the inhabitants of that territory. But of course, they weren't all of the same religion. Um, they were clearly Muslims. Um, Buddhism had also been big there, although it had by and large vanished by now. Um, and there were even some Christians, uh, partly to do with other <laughs> previous colonial in incursions. Um, but uh, the British wanted to say, well, who are, who are the majority who aren't all those other things? Um, let's use this term Hinduism to classify that, that group of beliefs. But it's so diverse. And at that time, mm. probably no, nobody would have used that label of themselves. But very quickly, um, it became adopted, um, proudly so, uh, to, to, to the extent that Hindu nationalism was born. Mm. <laughs> you know, with the embrace of that title. So it's a bit like, you know, I guess, um, homosexuals, you know, reclaiming the word gay, or right. something of that sort. <laughs> That's um, a good metaphor. So, yeah, so, yeah, so Hinduism, it becomes yeah, yeah. a label that everyone's happy to use. Yeah. But originally, it was from, I think, Persian, yeah. um, referring to people who lived east of the Indus River. So yeah, yeah. those people over there, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're the Hindus. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't really have you know, a unifying doctrine. It's, it's, it's actually a collection of different religions. And there are devotional religions oriented towards, as I've said, Shiva, Vishnu, and uh, you know, aspects of the goddess. Um, there are you know, all these systems of yoga um, are described in Hindu texts for the, for, for the most part. I mean, there are other teachings on yoga in other religions as well. But they're a very different way of looking at the world, um, not necessarily religious, um, although some you know, cross over with religious teachings. Um, and then there's all of these other preceding traditions that get combined with, with these different approaches, what we might call folk religion, I suppose. We don't really have a trace yeah. of where it comes from, predating the Vedas. 